Hello and welcome to the Real Estate Nerds Podcast. On this Bad Beats episode, we will explore the human side of real estate investing with a seasoned pro about to make the legendary worst deal of their life. A deal isn't just the investment, it is also the person. Stay with us and learn what it takes to be the best investor. Hi, and welcome to the Real Estate Nerds Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Royal Smith, the owner of Royal Legal Solutions, the one-stop shop for everything tax, legal, and business for real estate investors. Uh, today, I'm very uh, privileged uh, to have uh, my friend Daniel here with me. Um, Daniel is a phenomenal investor, and I'd like to um, have Daniel, if you wouldn't mind just sharing with us, you know, what do we need to know about your background before you're you know, talking about the deal today? Um, to get a good sense of where you're coming from and entering into that. Sure, absolutely. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for having me on. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Um, my background, uh, similar to you, is I'm an attorney. Uh, I mostly do real estate transactional work in my firm. Um, and then over the years, decided I wanted to get in on the investment side of it to build up that passive income that everyone speaks about and wants to attain. So I started that process in about 2013. And thankfully, haven't looked back and have grown my portfolio to now of 84 units. Oh, that's fantastic, Daniel. Um, what did you want to talk about today? Do you want to talk about a best deal or a worst deal? Uh, I think probably the worst deal because hopefully that can give uh, the listeners some guidance and some stuff to learn from someone else's mistakes, which I think is always better than learning from your own. Um, yeah, I think so. That's man. good with you. Yeah. 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 It's like you always, I forget exactly how my, uh, my grandfather used to always describe it to me. He's like, you know, the, the, the idiots uh, don't learn from their own mistakes. You know, smart people learn from their <laughs> own mistakes and geniuses will learn from other, other people's mistakes. And I don't expect you to be a genius, but I at least expect you to be smart. Right. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> so. We'll make some geniuses here today from your, from your story, hopefully. Yeah, uh, I hope so. Uh, so, so give us a, a little bit of, um, you know, background about like what, you know, from 10,000 feet up, like what is this uh, deal that, uh, that turned out to be so bad for you? Sure. So I uh, bought a building, a commercial building in New Jersey. Um, it was one of my first acquisitions that I made as far as being an investor. And I had four tenants in the property. Um, so of course, when I purchased the property, it would look good as far as cash flow. It looked good on paper. And um, I decided, the, I guess the issue that was the problem was I was going to manage it myself. Um, and that is where I ran into issues that I don't, I don't do that anymore by myself. You no longer do the property management. Is your management fell Correct. south on you? Yeah, not for, not for any of the properties I own. Um, and the reason it became the worst deal, I guess, is because, um, as you hear probably the story all too often, is when you manage your own property, you end up becoming friendly with the tenants who get to know you and get to feel comfortable enough with you that they can speak with you about their issues, which really don't have any effect on their obligation to make their monthly rent payments. And what happened is over the years, there was one particular tenant who coincidentally also was an attorney who was running, you know, uh, slower in her practice and continued to need additional time to pay her rent. And of course, being the nice guy that I am, I said, okay, you know, no problem. I'll, I'll work with you. And then it uh, developed as, you know, then she would pay one month behind. So at the end of the second month, she would pay back the rent for the first month. So that continued. Then it became, she was two months behind, but then she would pay in the third month to come back. And um, I decided, you know, I, in, imprudently, because again, it was my own decision to not force more action. I let it go for, continue to go for a while. And then what happened is, of course, two months became three months, became four months. And when it hit, uh, you know, by the time it hit three months, I was already extremely frustrated and angry even, I would say. So on month four, as soon as month, four, month, as month three was approaching with no payment for the past three months, I served her a notice that if she had not paid at least half of the back rent that she owed, then I was going to have to evict her. And so it became a little tenuous, of course, and um, she, of course, did not pay. And in New Jersey, and you, you're where, Scott, again? I'm in Austin, Texas. Okay, so in Texas, I believe Texas is landlord-friendly, correct? Yeah, very landlord-friendly. Okay, so in New Jersey, as I'm sure you know, well, just like California and New York, very tenant-friendly. So it's not as easy to get a tenant out even for non-payment of rent. And, of course, she knew that. 
So what happened was by the time the eviction was filed, no, let me backtrack a second, a second, excuse me. So she said, okay, I'll have a check for you at the end of a week. Now, just to give you perspective in New Jersey and why I don't invest in New Jersey any longer is over the four months, she accumulated a debt of over $14,000 that she owed me in rent. So, and of course people hear that and they're like, oh my God, that's insane. And that's just unfortunately what it is. So when I wrote her the letter, I said, you need to pay at least $7,000. So I, you know, by this date and on that date, I texted her because of course, that's how a lot of people choose to communicate these days. I said, I'm coming by today to pick up your check. She said, oh, okay. I had mailed it to your office, but I'll, I'll, I'll just put a stop payment and I'll give you a new check. So I show up and she looks at like, won't even make eye contact, looks down and gives me an envelope and says, I'm so sorry. This is all I can afford. And from the 14,000 or so she owed me, she gave me a check for $100. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. And I just, I just shook my head. Well, and I, I, left and I, all. I mean, really? I mean, right. Right. Yeah. And that's what everyone says. It's Keep like a stop in the face. Seriously. That's stupid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're going to do that. So it was, it was unbelievable. And, uh, it was valuable lessons learned along the way of again, why I don't manage any of my own properties, why I use professional management on everything is because I treat it like a business. When I first started, again, my first deal, it was, I was just getting into it. So I thought I could probably just save some money doing it myself. And it ended up costing me quite a bit of money. So I evicted her, I, you know, so it, she gave me that check. I immediately made up my mind. I'm just going right now and I'm filing the eviction, which I did. But of course, in New Jersey, it took her another two months to get out. So she accumulated a total rent obligation that's due an owing of $19,000. And that's something you're never really going to collect on anyway, right? Because you would have to, yeah, probably, probably have not to be able to seize anyway, right? Right. So then I have to deal with now, do I want to go after her for this money? Do I want to spend the time, the money, the stress? Um, but she is out of the property. So, but now of course, now I have a vacancy and now I'm looking for a tenant to fill that vacancy. Right. Wow. So, so is that, is that the uh, end of the pain right there? As a, essentially losing nineteen thousand dollars and then having to get the uh, landlord yeah. out. Wow. Losing nineteen thousand and it continually now not having a tenant in the property, um, because if commercial space in New Jersey is not very sought after, so there's not as much of a demand as in a single family home or a duplex, which is where my other holdings are, is with those kind of properties. Mm. Mm. So um, when you're looking at you know, doing like a postmortem uh, of this kind of deal here, Daniel, are you really looking at, um, I mean, a couple of things I think, you know, strike me as one is, is I say, well, I was trying to save some money and rent it out on their own. People do that successfully all the time, right? Right. Where they rent properties on their own. But I think there's like something that's more personal here into it. Is it like, you found out it's like, oh, Daniel shouldn't be renting out properties on his own. Like it's very, Correct. right? And yeah. is that kind of like, is that a piece that you weren't, um, uh, aware of before you got in this transaction that's like, Hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm typically like a pretty nice guy and, and the people will try to take advantage of me because of that. Or was this the first experience you've had with that? Um, as far as the rent, this was the first time it happened that way. Um, I own the building in, in a company name. So, um, I, you know, I said, I am a member of, you know, I work for the company, but of course when someone's there, that tenant was there for just about two and a half years. And over the two and a half years, we got a little friendlier and, you know, although she knew I may have had a partner, um, I guess she just figured that it was really me instead of just the company or I'm the property manager for the company. I have a boss. I have an owner that I report to. Um, so I really like that now when I use uh, professional property management companies, that kind of creates that buffer where people don't feel that they can just do that because they know who Dan is. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, part of that's like knowing you, right? But ultimately... Mm -hmm like you're kind of responsible for the the decision in a lot of way, right? To be able to say like, well, I'll let yes. people slide, right? Yes. And yes. Um, I, I think that's like where, where like from your stories where it really rings out is like what seems really awesome about it is to say like, well, that doesn't work for me to be a property manager because it doesn't work for me as a person because I'll just let mm -hmm. people get away with stuff and when I shouldn't. And, and how I'm going to solve that is I'm just going to outsource that piece because that's too yeah. stressful or too whatever. And how absolutely to how to do that absolutely so okay. again i won't make that mistake again of doing it myself um at all ever again yeah what um was that something that 
you know, a lot of times I, I think like in, in life, just in general, right. I, I've always had this old saying that it's, you know, life will keep trying to present you with a, a lesson over mm-hmm. and over again until you learn it. And a lot of times those lessons are really painful for us. Is that, yeah. is that something that like that you've encountered, you know, from your professional, you know, this is like part of real estate investing, but this is also like really personal to us, like as individuals as we go through it. Is oh that yeah. It was very, very thing? stressful. Yeah. I would say absolutely. It's been, it was a lot, the course, the cause, excuse me, for a lot of stress, a lot of uh, angst, anxiety, worry all the time. Um, you know, not, you know, always having to know I have to confront this tenant, but it's never a pleasant experience at that point. Um, again, the property taxes in New Jersey and the mortgage payment on there on the building are high. So every month I'm losing money. Uh, and of course, negative cash flow is very bad, as we all know. So it was, it was a myriad of things that unfortunately just uh, created a perfect storm. In, in terms of like the, the context of getting into it to, to make the decision to do the, per, the personal property management, is there any type of, um, was there any indication to you ahead of time that that was going to be an issue for you to, to try to do this? It was, it was not. The, the person that I bought the building from had managed it himself also for some 17 to 20 years or so, somewhere around that range. And his tenants were all long-term tenants. And I had met them and, you know, good relationship. And over time, two, two of them left on their own. And, you know, their time had come to either grow their business or do whatever. And we all left on very amicable terms. Uh, this was a tenant that I obtained on my own, um, which, of course, did, uh, was good for a year and a half. And then the last year was not so good. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering about like when you look at, you know, there's tenant acquisition, but it sounds like a year and a half, like maybe there's some different stuff you could do for systems for that. But I mean, I don't know, right. Those are kind of hit and miss. Like really Mm -hmm. what the, really what the, um, the, the pieces that's really interesting, um, at least from, from what I'm picking up, um, in this story is, is looking at it saying like, what do we do when we, you know, how do we, one, how do we get awareness of like an issue that we have, um, like for that's exhibited from your example for, and then also what do we do to like be able to preemptively know like, Oh, this is probably going to be an issue for me. Um, it sounds mm-hmm. like you already came up with a solution, which was if I'm aware of the issue that I have here, which is, you know, uh, it's difficult for me to deal with people and not be nice. You know, I like being nice. To right. Be, right. Like, conflicts is not something that I like. Um, then I'm going to outsource like conflict onto other people. Um, but there, I was just wondering if there's like ways that, um, that we can look for like as investors or people that are new into business to say, you know, when I'm looking prospectively, like I'm about to make a decision. Um, did that experience teach you anything to say like before the next time I'm making a decision that's similar to this, I'm going to do X, Y, Z to like take the moment to become aware say like what issues are going to come up for me here when I'm getting into here, since I have like this new awareness of what I'm like in this, you know, this kind of scenario. Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, a little, I would say like, I, I try to do more homework and due diligence on my end up front, speaking with people that are ex- more experienced than I, and that have gone through things that I haven't to try to pick their brains at that time. This was 2013. Say so it was the beginning of the 2013. And, you know, again, thinking that I, I can just do it myself. I probably know what I need to know instead of now I have um, a lot of people in my network and my community that I can call on and say, Hey, you've been through this. I haven't. Um, give me your two cents. Let me know what you think I'm doing here. What am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? How can I avoid the mistakes, which I hope again, people are getting from hearing my story so they don't make that same mistake as well. So on this particular deal, you think that it would have gone really differently if you would have had like a network of people to rely on to help coach you through what to do it in that type of scenario, which you didn't have um, at the time you were having I do. To, yeah. Yeah, I do. I do think so. For people that don't currently have that type of network and they're trying to get into the deals, like what have you found to be an effective way for you to be able to build that network? Sure. I think uh, going to local RIA meetings, finding local investors uh, in your area that you're operating in is a great way. Um, there's tools obviously online to meet people that are real estate investors and then just building a relationship with those people by, you know, either phone calls, face to face, emails, however you can stay in touch with these people that I, what I found too is most of these people are not only willing to help, but they want to help um, because they don't want people to make the same mistakes they did. 
So I've gotten that advice on other deals I've done going forward, which again, I didn't have at the time when I did this deal. So I think if people are active in trying to find other investors who can guide them, they'll, they'll have an easy time finding them and getting the resources they need so they don't make those mistakes that can cost them so much money. Yeah. Um, and in terms of, you know, networking with everybody, I found, and I think a, a lot of people I've talked to says, man, you really got to kiss a lot of toads sometimes to find the people that are, you know, uh, right. going to be really helpful for you. Have you found any like particular way that you approach that to be able to, you know, really make those the high quality relationships and kind of avoid the draining and time consuming pieces of, um, you know, kissing all those toads? Uh, I wish I could say that there's a, there's a good answer on that, but I think it's just like you said, you do have to kiss a lot of toads before you can learn and not have to kiss the toads anymore. <laughs> uh, but I find that usually if you're, if you're, you know, you just present yourself honestly and you're respectful with other people and now you're, you're, whether you're asking for help or you're just, you know, ping ponging ideas with each other, most people are happy to help and will make the time to do that. That's awesome. And in terms of recruiting those relationships, like how often are you usually trying to, um, you know, ping those people to, to develop or, or maintain those types of relationships? Um, well, in the beginning, I think it's more, there's more effort and more, like you said, pings that you want to connect with that person on. Um, and then obviously, you know, following up with them, you know, I would say at least once a month. And then, you know, as people go on their ways, you probably every two months, you want to touch base with them. Hey, how's it going? what's going on. Hey, I wanted to just update you. I did X, Y, and Z. Thank you for your help. And I think as long as you're staying in, in semi-frequent contact with those people, you never know when you're going to want to, you know, they may want your advice. You may want their advice again. You may do something together. Um, so it's always good to have that presence where you can keep in touch with the people, especially that helps you along the way. How important is it to get like that face-to-face -face stuff? I know one time, sometimes it's really surprised me. Um, and when forming like these types of connections with people is that I thought they only were, you know, had information about one area that I could use them for a resource for. Um, but then it actually turns out that they know, you know, 10 different things. And I had no idea right. until I would spend, for me, it's always usually come out when I've had like prolonged face-to-face -face contact with somebody like over lunch or, or something like that. Right. Really oh, I agree. Like I have, I have people now that, that have reached out to me and said, Oh, I want to take you for a coffee. And I'm like, well, let's get lunch because I agree with what you just said, Scott. And it's, you know what, when you have time in front of someone and you can really get deeper into conversation, you find out that they know much more than even they may have realized they know or than you thought they knew or you were there for. And conversations could lead into a whole multitude of ways that can end up opening doors for you that you never even dreamed of. Yeah, I think so. There's like some type of escalation there. It's like really important face-to-face -face contact with people for yeah. like the really high value people that are like worth to say, okay, I'll actually carve out a whole hour, you know, to say, right. like, well, let's go get lunch. Right. And I think it's yeah. important because, yeah, because then you're realizing someone's taking at least an hour, if not more, you, the body language is there. You can, you can read each other's, you know, the way you're looking at each other, the way you're speaking. I had a meeting actually with, a, with an investor face-to-face uh, -face in New York City. And um, it went so well. And he said, you know, I really appreciate you're so genuine and honest and forthright with me. I want to partner with you and go and buy 30 units. And so now all of a sudden I'm looking at expanding my business by 30% in the next four months uh, just because of a face-to-face -face meeting. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And there's probably something that's pretty nuanced, I bet, in the way that you're presenting that opportunity for people, right? I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of times... Um, I've seen some of the more successful deal makers that they'll do. So we'll talk a lot about like what they're doing with people and kind of open the door to say like, you know, this is what I'm doing and we're, we're right. allowing other people to participate. But as like a really soft way of just introducing the deal out there to kind of say, and then people, if they want it and they want to know more, a lot of times they'll, they'll let you know. Right. So yeah. it be that awkward, you know, piece of it. Right. Like, absolutely. Get it? Yeah, exactly. And it's not like I'm selling anything or, it's just coming up naturally in conversations. And then people are like, oh, can you tell me more? How do you do that? How, what's this? And then the conversation inevitably flows into what they're looking for and what I have to offer. And, you know, it's worked very well that way. When you're sitting down in those meetings with people, is your intention to get them to say yes, that they want to participate in that 30 unit deal? Or is your intention sitting down that conversation merely to like connect and share information or what? what, what yeah, it really, it's, that? it's to connect and share information. And, you know, I didn't expect that this person is going to want to do that level of a deal. I've had others who have said they want to do, you know, similar type of deals. And it ends up some people, you know, hey, thanks for the information. Let's keep in touch. 
And of course, timing is very important. So, you know, I, but I never present and say, hey, do you want to do this deal? It's just, you know, how it comes up in conversation and it flows and you end up talking about a multitude of things that you didn't even think you were going to get to. And sometimes those hour lunches become two and a half or three hour lunches where you're really getting deeper with someone and getting to know them better. Um, and those are always the best because then you, you have that more of a connection with them when you leave and you just keep in touch with them and, you know, you pursue opportunities together. Yeah, I think, um, I think you're right, man. I think that's really what I, I've had as part of like my professional work that's actually turned out to be much more enriching for me is like when we've had lunches that have gone two to three hours. Because then it's mm-hmm. like I'm actually connecting with an individual that's much more than just about business. And then it forms right. those like long term relationships that are um, the really impactful ones about, you know, yeah. like fundamentally drive like cor- changing course for me, like as a person with that. And then those shorter ones, you know, typically is what always, I think that your strategy around saying like, well, just make sure you stay up to date with them like once a month and keep sharing with them uh, is really powerful because it just keeps you like front of mind of people to think like they yeah. see you with X, Y, Z type of opportunity whenever they meet somebody, know about it or whatever. Um, right. Comes across with that. Has that kind of been your experience? Yeah, absolutely. I would agree a hundred percent with that. Yeah, that's cool, Daniel. Um, well, in terms of a lesson learned for today from, you know, this worst deal, I know we kind of start got off track and talk, start talking about networking and <laughs> connection a little bit. Um, but I think like the, those pieces that you identified with that of what would, have, you know, for me, the lesson learned that I got out of your talk today was like, if, if perhaps if you would have had more of a network getting into this deal and had more of those connections and um, into it. And just like you said, like that would have helped you avoid, you know, the entire thing and, and that there's maybe networking doesn't have to be so painful of, you know, kissing toads and thinking like, Oh, every one of those is a waste. Really. You only need a, a even just a handful of really strong relationships with people that are really high quality is all you really right. need to be able to move mountains. Um, Absolutely. That's what I pulled out. If, if there was something that you said that you wanted listeners to, to walk away from t- your story here today with as like a lesson learned from it, what would that be? Um, I would say to make sure you keep your education going. Don't think you know it all. Don't think you're better than the stories you hear. Because <laughs> as you know, seasoned investors, rookie investors, we all have stories of things that have gone wrong. We've all kissed some toads along the way. So rather than you having to kiss your own toads, look for that guidance, look for those people to help you so you don't have to kiss the same toads. Is that, would you say like that that's like essential when you're getting into anything that's new is to always try to find and recruit a mentor of somebody else that's done it before? Absolutely. That would be, if I, yeah, if one piece of advice would be that. Find someone who's been there and done that and is doing it who can guide you. That's awesome, Daniel. And I know there's going to be people from here that have already connected with you from, you know, today's show. And if they want to connect with you, Daniel, um, you know, who are you looking to connect with and what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Sure. Absolutely. I'm looking to connect with uh, people that are motivated, that are looking to either grow their businesses, grow together and look for opportunities together, just create synergy. Um, the best way to contact me is by email. And my email is uh, B as in boy, A-R-L-I-D-A-N at gmail.com. So it's my last name, first name, Barley Dan at gmail.com. That's awesome, Dan. Um, thanks for coming on the show today. And of course, uh, this has uh, been a great show. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the host, Scott Royal Smith. This has been another episode of uh, Real Estate Nerds Podcast. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, you know, I'd say reach out to Dan. I know he's doing uh, a lot of work with his real estate. He's working on a number of different deals. He's an attorney there in New Jersey. I think he's probably going to have some sound advice for you uh, on your business and, um, and be willing to connect with you if you're somebody that's trying to get big things done. Um, I know he already has a portfolio of 80 plus units. And so this guy's already built it out. Um, and if you're in that area or just anywhere, I bet he'd be willing to uh, share with some free information for you and, and help you guys get going. So, um, of course. Excellent. Um, all right. Well, that's all for today, Dan. Thanks all so right, much. Thank for being you on so show. much, Scott. It was such a pleasure, and I look forward to working with you soon too. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Take care. Thank you. That's all for this Bad Beats episode. I'm your host, Scott Royal Smith, with the Real Estate Nerds Podcast. Did you see yourself in any part of that story? I know I did. If you enjoyed the show, leave a review to help clue in the sleeping masses of what they need to know and what we all need reminders of. Do your good deed for the day. Thanks, and I'll see you again soon.